Welcome to All Access, where we meet at the intersection of healthcare and generic and biosimilar medications. Brought to you by the Association for Accessible Medicines, representing the generics and biosimilars industry. Hello and welcome. Welcome to All Access. I'm Dan Leonard. Uh, we're very fortunate here at AAM to have access to some of the top strategic thinkers and most uh, successful business leaders in the pharmaceutical industry. And that is certainly true of my guest today. His expertise and skillful leadership is so sought after that he was actually the only person who have served as the chairman of the board of GPHA, the Generic Pharmaceutical Association, which was the forerunner to AAM, and the Canadian Generic Pharmaceutical Association. And uh, if that's not enough, he was also has also served as the chair of the Healthcare Distribution Alliance's uh, Knowledge Partner, the HDA Research Foundation. I am talking about and talking with today, President and Chief Executive Officer of Apotex Incorporated, or Apotex Inc., uh, Mr. Jeff Watson. Jeff, welcome to All Access. Great. Thank you, Dan. Great to be here and great to see you. It's good to see you as well. On this particular podcast, this program, you know, we have... Uh, you know, critical issues around the generic pharmaceutical industry, biosimilars that we talk about, but we also like to get to know our guests uh, really at a, at a more personal level. So I'd love to start there. Tell us a little bit about your early years, you know, where you grew up uh, in Canada, uh, what you got into as a, as a young man, and, and then where that, where that took you in life. Yeah, thanks. Uh, um, I actually grew up in the east coast of Canada, talking to you now from the Toronto area, but uh, on, on the east coast of Canada, I grew up in a place called Halifax, Nova Scotia which is where I spent my younger formative years and uh, went to the university there um, and, you know, made my way to the Toronto area around 1986, but basically um, good opportunity there, interested in sports, uh, you know, lots of things going on, uh, but I've been away from home. So I always said, I, I always like the opportunity because I have such fond memories of the East Coast when we have the opportunity to speak to it about it. And my family are still there, and, and that's where I grew up, and I've been able to visit frequently. But yeah, that's uh, that's where I have now. I'm at that stage in my career in life where I've lived longer, where I've moved away too than where I grew up. So that's where I find myself. So before you got into the pharmaceutical industry as a profession, you uh, were a sportsman growing up, and particularly football, Amer American football. I guess in your case. Canadian football. Yes, correct. And I think that's, you know, in, in, if I kind of tie it into your original question, the reason that I left uh, the East Coast or left Halifax to come to, you know, central Canada up in the Toronto area was to play football in the Canadian Football League. So I had not been chasing a career other than sports. And, uh, you know, so I'd had a couple of years in the Canadian Football League to play. And that's really what brought me here and stayed, but uh, all, all very fond and good memories. And yeah, I, we say, as I, I may have mentioned to you in the past, when you play in the Canadian Football league you play for the love of the sport and not the money I, I suspect that's very true you played in college i assume and then into the cfl yeah i actually played at st mary's university where i went to school and uh, you know was drafted in 1986 played a few years in the cfl and and it was really you know in between my third and fourth year that uh I had had an opportunity in the industry, but yeah, that's a short career, but lots of great memories. What, what Canadian teams, team or teams did you play for? Yeah, drafted to the Hamilton Tiger Cats in 86, but also played with Toronto and, uh, and the Saskatchewan Rough Riders in 88. Very so. cool. As a lineman, is that right? For offensive uh, guard, yes. Guard offensive. Yeah. So, okay, so uh, from the uh, offensive line to the front lines of the pharmaceutical <laughs> uh, industry, so let's talk about that, you know, shift from the gridiron to uh, a marketing and sales position early on in your, in your career. Were you at uh, Apotex right off the bat or were there companies before? No, no, I, I, in between my third, third and fourth year, the, there was an opportunity through, once again, you know, the network and, and friends to, uh, to jump into, uh, uh, into pharma. So I spent, uh, you know, kind of post uh, CFL and prior to Apotex uh, a few years with, with pharma and med surge, uh, kind of getting... Um, you know, my um, getting some experience into the healthcare space, but that's where my, my start began and then not over to, to Apotex until 93. Tell us a little bit more about Apotex. Obviously, you have a significant footprint in Canada as the largest pharmaceutical company in Canada. Um, your capacity, and you can check me on my numbers, but uh, more than 20 billion doses or tablets a year. Uh, uh, how large is your uh, workforce at this point? Yeah, the, this Current position, we're um, you know been in business roughly 47 years, uh, established in 1974. We, we're currently uh, have a, an employee base of around 8,000 employees. We have a significant amount of employees in our North American markets, uh, 
Canada, US and Mexico, and we have a large uh, facility in India, but we, we are an international company and we do have a real significant presence here in Canada, which has really been you know, the start of the business and really where we, we grew the business in the early days. Well, we've certainly value Apotex as a, as a member, as a par- partner, you know, right over the border in, in Canada. So, and we appreciate uh, all your good work. But you do have a facility, you have facilities in, in Florida, is that correct? We do. We have a transdermal patch facility in Florida. We have distribution in, uh, in, in Indianapolis. We have our corporate uh, offices in, um, in Florida as well. So two, two, two centers there. Um, and once I said, you know, we've, we've got a strong North American base. It's really been our focus. Our core mark markets have been the, the U.S. and Canadian markets for many, many years. Earlier on in your career, you left Apotex for a, a brief period to go into the retail pharmacy sector, uh, working for Shoppers Drug Mart, um, Canada's largest pharma- pharmaceutical chain. Did that um, impact your perspective on our our industry at all as you moved up the corporate ladder? Yeah, actually it did. It was, it was a good opportunity. I've spent, you know, most of my career now in the generic space, but as I reflect back, it, it was a, a great opportunity to get out, work in a, in a business development role. Uh, and it, it gave me some perspective, I think, of the complexity of, you know, our, our, some of our key customers and what they're dealing with. And it's a, it's a broader look when you, when you kind of work in the supply side, like I have from, for most of my career and you get into, uh, you know, our, our, our supply chains that we sell into, you just have, a, I think, a greater understanding of, of the complexities, as I said, that they're dealing with. But, you know, they're, they're patient focus, how they're moving product through distribution, how they're acquiring product, and then all of the other facets that they're dealing with on a daily basis as they run their business. So it just gave me, a, I think, a better understanding uh, of what their day-to-day could look like and some of the strategic elements that they're really working hard at. I'll just say one of the, this has been one of the great um learning experiences for me since I've joined is this understanding everything that goes into the supply chain. I'll, I'll break that into two, the upstream supply chain, how you know, all of the product gets to you for the manufacturing, but then the downstream supply chain, how it gets uh, out to you, the customers, ultimately. That is uh, no small feat. And uh, the industry did very, very well during this pandemic, I think. If you would agree with yeah, that. I think it was a it was we all have these moments when you when you work in 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 healthcare and certainly I've never worked through a pandemic, but it, it's really when the industry was really put to the test. And I think I'm, I'm extremely proud to have been in the industry and look at the resiliency that we have shown as an industry through our supply chains. And as you mentioned, they're highly integrated, mm-hmm. global in nature, uh, procuring materials from from all over the world. And I think uh, the industry did a, a magnificent job in terms of delivering. Uh, product to the markets. I agree 100%. And, uh, but it, it is still an issue of a significant policy issue for us uh, here in the States and, and no doubt in Canada as well that we're working on. So as you um, moved on or stayed on at Apotex, moving up in increasingly more uh, critical positions, including chief operating officer, president of the global uh, generics division, which was the largest business line at Apotex. And then since 2018 as, as president and CEO, and under your leadership, Apotex has continued to grow. Um, and unlike many of your peer companies, it's done so mainly through uh, organic growth. What is your uh, philosophy of, of growth for Apotex, and, and uh, how, how do you how would you speak to that going forward? Well, I think it's uh, it really has kind of started right from our founder. We've uh, we've always um, you know our, our we have been an organic company in terms of growth and how we viewed things. I would say for relative to our size, even if you go back years, we. We would overinvest in, and by some would say in our R and D programs, we would overinvest in, in our intellectual property litigation in terms of trying to get products to market. So, you know, our, our growth platform was really, you know, looking to to invest internally into our, into our key core businesses and develop some strategic partnerships along the way. Um, we've continued to look at, you know, I think vertical integration has always been a big thing for the company. So, for example, we've been, you know, we've had our own API facilities now for for 20 plus years. So we've been really early on there. And at some, at some point we've, we've recently divested, but we've even, we're ver- vertically integrated to, you know, manufacturing of our own bottles. So we, we've been um, able to take, I think, a long view to the business and kind of weather some important storms. But, but, but basically, I think just investing in our core, our core company uh, technologies, looking for partnerships. And then also, uh, I think, staying, trying to stay focused in some of our key markets and, and seeing that we have the opportunity to grow there. And I think we haven't changed a lot, obviously, since you know all of the events that we've been through, we you know we are not in a position to to acquire now certainly either. But we'll, we're continuing to forge uh, strong partnerships and, and strongly invest in in our core assets. 
You're also a good corporate citizen. Apotex is a great corporate citizen. And uh, you know, during the pandemic, which we were just speaking to a few minutes ago, um, like many of our member companies, but you were very active in um, donating uh, doses and donating hand sanitizer and masks and PPE. And uh, would you like to speak to that or your philanthropic philosophy? Yeah, I think really it's just been a continuation of, of what Barry's vision has been through the years that I've been at the company. We have always been uh, you know, there in times of need or trying to be there in times of need, whether, you know, we've seen crises erupt around the globe, whether it's been earthquakes and of course now no more critical than this pandemic and finding where we've had opportunities. So it really is just a continuation of, of a, a philosophy within the company. We've, um, we've always been, been ready and able and willing to give. And I think we've been proud of the work that we've been able to do through this, these last 18 months. And, you know, once again, just, I think, uh, also some recognition to our peer group, I think, who, you know, as I've, I've witnessed as well as, you, you know, see publications and people really stepping up and, and finding opportunities to donate in critical times uh, for, uh, for the best, um, you know, outcomes for patients. So, yeah, it's, um, it, it has been, it has been quite a journey, but as, I'm proud to say that we're continuing on with really a, a, a well-established uh, virtue in the company that our founder had started. Well, you mentioned your founder, Barry Sherman, and uh, it's known about the, the, the tragedy that occurred in December of 2017, probably known more so in Canada than, than here in the States. But, uh, and I know I'm sure it's a difficult topic even to this day to discuss, but at this time, you were the chairman of the board of AAM or the, the, as GPHA was transitioning to AAM, uh, and then all of a sudden found yourself having to uh, take up the mantle of leadership at, at Apotex after this terrible tragedy that occurred in, in Canada. What can you speak to about those events and that period of time? Well, I mean, it was, uh, you know, kind of even if you think back today for me, it's, it's kind of an unimaginable set, unimaginable set of circumstances to deal with. And we've had, of course, a, a large organization with employees around, um, around the globe. And we had, um, you know, a founder was in the business day, day in and day out and, and working in the business. So it was, uh, it was an incredible set of circumstances. Um, you know, I think we, 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 we had an opportunity to take a pause when it had happened to try to digest what we were dealing with. And then of course, you know, as a company in, in healthcare, you really, you didn't have time to really stop and pause too long because we had patients that were really in need of medicines. We've got, you know, in, in, significant penetration of, of our businesses in our core markets where we had hundreds of millions of prescriptions going out that needed to continue to be filled. So I think we, can, we, we tried to calibrate as best we could. And of course, these events take time to kind of understand and digest. And I think that's what we did. But we, we, um, we carried on really with, a, with the legacy that our founder had started. Um, you know, we communicated to our employees very frequently, of course, and really had to up that level of communication. So it was really breaking down time to you know, not necessarily at that point in our lives, as I remember days and weeks, but we were into, you know, hours and minutes trying to, uh, to keep focused on, on those important critical steps that need it. And we, we, we made our way through it. And I think it was um, really the rallying cry of, of what, as I mentioned, our founder had started, but really the, the patient at the end of the day, I think all of our employees could, um, could rally around seeing that we continue to deliver products to those patients that were in, in great need to make sure that uh, we continued on with uh, the, the important needs of their healthcare care uh, regimens that they had through through this. But it, it was there's no question, I think, as, uh, as my career wound, winds down, I, I might have time to breathe. I don't know that we fully have sat down and caught our breath because we were just really stabilizing our business coming out of out of that tragedy of 2017. And now we've entered ourselves into a pandemic. And uh, so, you know, we, we really have not had, a, I think, a full appreciation of, of that, but the company is, has done very well. I'm very proud of our leaders and our employees. They've really, um, you know, stood, stood tall in, in some really difficult times. Yeah, that is almost unimaginable. That the you know, tragic murder of the founder of your company and someone that was, like you said, in the business every day and then right into a pandemic. But one of the things you, you said really struck me is that you cannot over communicate in a crisis like that. Yeah, I think that became kind of um, what you know what we relied on daily, and I think you 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 even during that period you get better at it, right? You're 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 out there, you're just trying to be tra as transparent as you can, and I think our employees really appreciate it. You know, real time updates. Um, there was no no shortage of them, and uh, obviously mobilizing people was 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 not hard because people really needed that information. This is still an unsolved crime yeah that's correct yeah yeah so Ong ongoing investigation ongoing 
ongoing. Correct. Well, let's shift gears again now to um, kind of the broader industry issues that are affecting not only Apotex, but all of your, uh, all of our other member companies. Drug pricing is always an issue, the, the issue of, of high cost brand drugs primarily. Um, and so there's no shortage of legislation in Congress here in the States. The administration is certainly looking at these issues aimed at um, the issue of drug pricing. You know, I like to say if the problem is drug pricing, then generics are the, uh, the solution. And we are in so many ways. But, you know, how do we how should we get through our messaging to lawmakers on the important role that generics play uh, around the world, not just here in the States and Canada, but around the world? Yeah, I think just having kind of I think been really involved and passionate about the, the work that we do and you do and, and our associations do. It's really about continuing to get our message out. And it, it is in the reality, it, it's it's hard work. It's not uh, it's not easy work because I, I do believe, you know, the, the data is with us. We see, you know, 90 percent of the prescriptions, for example, in the U.S. done a, a phenomenal job uh, in 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 the United States in terms of conversion of prescriptions to generics where there's tremendous savings with only 20 percent of the spend and budget. So I do think we have you know, much of the data behind us, but as, as the, um, I guess as the industry has kind of, you know, evolved, it's become, I think, more complex for uh, lawmakers and people to understand exactly how all the pieces come together. And the narrative sometimes can get a bit blurry. So I, th I think as an industry, we just have to stay um, hyper-focused on, on this area, we have to continue to invest in, in organizations like AAM, and we have to continue to stay, uh, not even investing in the organization, but that's why I'm, I am passionate about our, our executives and executives in the industry staying, you know, involved and engaged and getting getting our message out there because it's it's uh, it, it's just going to be something that's a process that's ongoing and I think we have to keep the focus up and keep telling our story, and and keep uh, I think breaking down those pieces of misinformation uh, when when sometimes that narrative gets lost. But uh, um, we we do have a lot going for us as an organization. We've brought tremendous savings of value. We'll continue to do that. I know on behalf of Apotex, we continue to work hard to get products to market. We continue to try to innovate to, to deliver those savings uh, into our core, into our core markets. And I know that seems to be the focus of everybody. There isn't a day that goes by where I don't tell somebody that we are ninety percent of the prescriptions filled in this country, yet only twenty percent of the of the cost, uh, which is a testament to not only the the reach of our industry, but the fact that uh, you know that we're the solution for to, to drug prices and keeping prices down. Um, and it is a message that resonates with policymakers, but it's one that has to be repeated over uh, and over again, just back to the kind of the importance of communication. Yeah, I think time in, right? I think, I think, I think that's why it is important that the, you know, our executives or, you know, I think I speak on behalf of the, our company that we stay engaged and involved and support our, our, our leaders like yourself and your team and on where we can help. And I think it's, uh, it can't be a passive process, in my opinion. I think you have to remain engaged and you have to remain uh, on, on top of the, the critical issues. So, yeah. We talk about our hope to come, you know, we're returning back to, to normalcy after the pandemic and, and everything that's occurred. But, um, you know, what is the, what does normal look like going forward? What's the future look like for Apotex? I and mean, what can you speak to as far as where the industry may be tracking as well? You know, we know from our work with FDA that complex generics are a new uh, area that uh, we're going to see a lot more activity in. Certainly biosimilars are, are, are growing, but you know, what do you see from where you sit and where, where might Apotex be headed uh, over the next number of years? Yeah, Dan, we, we see tremendous opportunity in, in the coming years, and they are in, in some of the key areas that you just had mentioned. We see, of course, uh, opportunities in biosimilars. We're not, as, as a company, as invested. We have a, a strong pipeline developing Canada, and we're looking at our U.S. opportunities currently as we speak. Complex generics are for sure an opportunity, and I think as we, as we see the opportunities evolve in those areas, We'll see the, the 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 regulators working with industry in ter in terms of helping to get products to market in terms of as as we're launching, uh, but we're 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 looking also at a patent cliff between 2023 and 2025 and and, and an opportunity that where some core products and and that are out in the market there will be opportunities for for Apotex uh, to launch and to participate in some of those um, on some of those products. So I, I think from an innovation point of view in the generic industry, there's there's, there's a lot happening, a lot of exciting opportunities in front of us in the next uh, three to five years. Well, just for our viewers on a patent cliff, this is a, when the uh, expiration of current patents by brand holders, either, either a large number of different brands or very large revenue uh, brands kind of um, 
I'll, I'll reach expiration date at the same time or roughly the same time. And that leads to, that's, that's the, the growth engine for our industry. Is that how you would have? Yeah, that's correct. I think you, you framed it quite well. It's, it's really either, you know, key, key critical molecules or, or a grouping of molecules that by some reason happen to hit, fall into these windows of time. And I, I think we see that, that coming. We had uh, the last patent cliff that the industry looked at in a large way was around 20, 13, 2012, 2013, 2014 into those years. And we just see some of those opportunities where the patents are expiring and the industry will, will likely be launching and Apotex will play its part uh, in that window of time as well. Well, let's put in a plug for, uh, for uh, your colleague, Peter Hardwick, who uh, was very helpful in, in, in introducing me to you, but Peter uh-huh. is now the vice chair of AAM. So we, we appreciate all the effort that he puts in and the time he puts into to our initiatives, and I think he's you know that's obviously coming from the from the top, and uh, uh, we appreciate that partnership. Well, we, we're we're happy to keep that legacy going, Dan. And uh, you know, as I mentioned to Pete, this is uh, it's it's not a, an opportunity that's taken lightly, and there's lots of time to be invested in this to do it well. So we're um, we're, we're certainly, and I'm certainly happy for Pete to be involved and and you know put and put his contribution into the industry and supporting uh, AAM. Well, I look forward to the day when we can, when that, uh, that border between our two countries kind of loosens up and I can actually meet Peter in person. Yeah. <laughs> it hasn't happened yet. I've been on a hundred Zoom calls with him, but well, that's a great conversation we've had today. I really appreciate it. And uh, I want to thank uh-huh. you, Jeff, for, for joining us today. Uh, I'll reiterate, thank you uh, for, to Peter Hardwick, who uh, is, works so very closely with us here at AAM uh, and our board and our team. Thank you for the time we spent here today. And, and I look forward to seeing what Apotex looks like in, uh, in the future. Thanks, Dan. Appreciate it. You have our support and a big uh, congratulations on the work you do and the work you've continued to do through this pandemic. And uh, we look forward to supporting you in, in any way we can. And I'm sure Peter's excited about this new opportunity as well. Thank you. Thank and you. thank you, everyone, for, uh, for, for tuning in to uh, All Access today with Jeff Watson. So thanks for joining us. We'll see you next time.